Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Imbal Blau. I'm a PhD candidate here in uh, the law faculty in Tel Aviv University. I'm happy to open the 21st annual forum uh, of young legal uh, historians and the Sixth Berg Institute uh, International Conference. And uh, we'll start with the first panel concerning law, family, and culture. Our first speaker is Yael Broidabat, a PhD candidate at the law faculty, Tel Aviv University, and she's also one of the organi organizers of this uh, amazing uh, conference. Uh, I invite Yael to give her a lecture regarding family law in transitional eras, legislative initiat initiatives, Israelis women's organizations at the first years of uh, statehood. Thank you again all for coming here. Um, so I'll start. Uh, times of transition uh, provide excellent opportunities for social changes. Specifically, they enable the promoting of social status of marginal groups. The story I tell here today is a story of a major social change uh, in a time of a major transition, the establishment of the Israeli state in 1948. It is a story about women's organizations that strive for equal opportunity and participation in the young state. It is a story of using law, and more concretely, family law, in order to promote significant social changes. Family law was not the only arena through which the Israeli women's organizations promoted their goals, but it was a very powerful one. The feminist activists who operated legal bureaus for women for more than two decades before the establishment of the state, were familiar with the various domestic problems that could be, at least partially, solved by the right legislation. The activists also understood the strong connection between women's status within their homes and, the fa and families, and their status in other social spheres, such as workplaces, the political arena, etc. If a woman, for instance, is free to choose her last name after getting married, if both parents are equally entitled for, uh, to be their children's guardians, if both spouses equally co-own their marital property, if all of those are established in, in a legislation that e explicitly declares that men and women are equal, Sorry. Mm. Uh, then women have better chance to, get to gain equality and autonomy both in the family and in the, in the public sphere. These were some of the provisions that were included in Rachel Cohen Kagan's Family and Women's Equality Bill in 1951. Cohen, a member in the first Knesset, sorry, uh, the Israeli, Knesset is the Israeli parliament, uh, was at that time also the chairwoman of uh, the Israeli branch of Vitzo. Vitzo is an international Zionist organization, a uh, women's organization. She was one of the two women who signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence and the only representative of a women party that was elected to the Knesset, to the parliament, since the establishment of Israel and up until today, practically. Okay. So the first Knesset was assembled in 1948, and two years later, in March 1951, Rachel Cohen declared that the Israeli women have waited long enough for the government to fulfill its promise to promote women's social equality. This promise was made in the Israeli Declaration of Independence, independence uh, along with a similar promise for other social minorities. The bill that, sub what was, that was submitted by Cohen was inspiring uh, and uh, rather radical even in contemporary terms, let alone 1950s terms. One of the bill's articles on which I will focus my talk today dealt with the marital property. It suggested that all property that was acquired throughout marriage uh, would be equally owned by both spouses, 
regardless of its actual registration. Every transaction that was related to the property according to this bill required the consent of both spouses and was void without it. In other words, Rachel Cohen uh, suggested or she proposed to set a regime of community property throughout the marriage. It should be mentioned that at that time, the uh, early 1950s, most of Israeli family law, uh, including the issue of marital property, was subjected to religious law. This was actually an, an inheritance of the uh, uh, legal regime uh, from the British mandate of the pre-state era, which granted legal autonomy to the di for the different religious communities uh, in the field of personal and family law. Under Jewish religious law, all property belonged to the husbands, including the property that women brought, br women brought with them to the marriage or acquired uh, during the marriage. So you can see why Cohen's bill was uh, considered radical, highly transformative, and highly controversial. When Cohen's bill was debated in the Knesset Assembly, Pinchas Rosen, the Minister of Justice, tried to dismiss it claiming that the, uh, the government was already preparing a bill concerning uh, women's e equality. Indeed, in 1949, two years, late, two years before, several internal re reviews were prepared in the Ministry of Justice uh, on a draft day of a bill titled A Law of Equal Rights for, uh, for the Woman. This draft, it should be mentioned and emphasized, had not dealt at all with the marital property and did not ensure wives uh, uh, write in it. It is hard to tell why the, this draft had not found its way to the Knesset, uh, the, the from the desk of the Ministry of Justice to the uh, Knesset, uh, and it is also hard to ignore the fact that after uh, holding it for more than two years, it took the government only six weeks to present its own bill as a reaction to Cohen's bill. In one sense, the 1951 governmental bill was more egalitarian than the 1949 draft. It suggested that women would not lose the, uh, the ownership of their property, the property they bring with them to the marriage. However, the governmental bill had not established anything with regard to the property accumulated during the marriage itself. When the governmental bill was discussed in the Knesset, Cohen and some other members of the Knesset had tried had tried to, no, no, not them, only the right ones, <laughs> uh, had tried to promote uh, a, a regime of uh, a community property within this uh, a governmental bill, but with no success. The reason give, given by the opposer, opposers for the, uh, for the dismissal of the community property was that this issue was too complicated and is not suitable for enactment on the last days of the first Knesset. Here we have an example for how transitional moments uh, serve as an excuse for uh, uh, delaying or postponing uh, uh, um, big uh, social changing rather than promoting them. So Prime, is Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, who's in the uh, left corner up, uh, promised the women's organizations that the issue of marital property would be discussed during the second Knesset's work. He failed to keep his promise. The marital property was abandoned for a few years until 1955. In 1955, the research department of the Ministry of Justice published uh, a draft titled The Individual and Family Bill. This was an extensive draft that included marital property among many other issues. This draft su suggested a regime of property separation throughout the marriage, followed by, by, by an equal division of property when marriage is dissolved. Accordingly, and despite the actual property separation, each transaction regarding the marital property according to this draft uh, uh, during the marriage required the consent of both spouses and was voidable without it. Nonetheless, this draft also suggested granting couples the freedom to diverge by contract from the equal division. This draft did not turn into an actual bill, but future bills uh, were based on it. Such were Emma Talmy's and Ruth Hecatin's bills, submitted in 1961. Talmi and Hecatin were both members in the Knesset and also members of the Israeli organization Women Workers' Council. Their bills had drifted further away from the idea of community property <coughs> that was suggested by Cohen uh, only uh, a decade before. Although their bills included an equal division at the end of marriage as well as a requirement for mutual consent for any transaction, 
in the marital property, there was no way to void the transactions that were not consented. However, contrary to the 1955 draft, Hecatin proposed that the equal division could not be overridden by, uh, by any other contra contra contractual agreement. Talmi, on the other hand, proposed to enable couples, couples to sign uh, agreements, but also thought that the law should ensure that this possibility would not be abused to deprive the so-called weak side from his or her uh, share in the property. Talmi's and Hecatin's bills were strongly opposed by both religious and secular uh, ministers and members of the Knesset. One of them was Zerach Verhaftig, who was the Minister of Religions. He had sent, sent dozens of letters to lawyers, legal scholars, rabbinical authorities, and so on. He claimed that the bills contradicted the Jewish law that should be uh, applied on marital property. He also thought that granting uh, wives ownership of a mar of over marital property when marriage is dissolved would encourage them to divorce their husbands, and that it would it also discourage men from getting married in the first place. From the secular and liberal side of the political map, Pichas Rosen, again the Minister of Justice, responded to Talmi's and Hecatin's bills by emphasizing the importance of letting couples decide, independent, decide and independently determine their property relations. He ignored the women's efforts to publicly discuss the unequal power relations within families. Despite these objection objections, it was decided not to dismiss the bills, but rather to further discuss them at the Knesset Committee of Constitution, Law and Justice. In 1965, after a few years of debates uh, at the committee and when it was apparent that its work was stuck, a new governmental committee was gathered, headed by Supreme Court uh, Justice Yoli Zussman. Zuss uh, at the end of its work in 1966, the committee issued a recommendation that, that served as the basis of a governmental bill submitted in 1969. So this is the property relations between spouses bill. Okay. This bill suggested a regime of property separation between spouses and wh when marries, marriage is dissolved, whether by divorce or death, the, mari the marital property is accumulated and its, its value is equally divided. This is unless the spouses have signed an agreement that indicates otherwise. The regime proposed by this bill was far from the community property regime that pro was proposed by Cohen in 1951. Nonetheless, it recognized women's rights in the marital property, their right to equality in the family, and their right for economic security following a divorce. Although the women organizations had supported the bill and lobbied for it, they, they had also tried to modify it by alerting their legislators with regard to the bill's major flaws. Specifically, they, they were worried from the triad combination of uh, a contr the control of the still. There was a control, uh, going on, ongoing control of religious law over marriage and divorce that granted uh, excessive power to husbands. The demand to finalize the divorce before balancing the value of property and the freedom of spouses to agree on, on a divergence from the equal division. The organizations warned the legislators back in 1971 when the uh, bill was debated in the committee, they warned that uh, this combination would probably lead to wives' extortion by husbands. Sign an agreement in which you waive your share in the marital property and I will grant you a divorce. Unfortunately, the organization had not convinced the legislators the law was that, was that was eventually enacted in 1973 maintained this triad combination. Even more unfortunately, they turned out to be right, and Jewish women were extorted for decades. Only in 2008 uh, was the law amended, and the demand for a finalized divorce in order to uh, equally divide the property was removed. This, uh, this as well was an admirable ac accomplishment of a contemporary coalition of women's organizations in Israel. So, what can we learn <laughs> from this uh, uh, piece of uh, history of Israeli law, family law? One cannot tell, of course, what would have happened if uh, Rachel Cohen uh, would have not recognized this transitional moment uh, of the establishment of this Israeli state that provided the chance uh, uh, for promoting change in, s in women's social and familial status. However, 
One cannot deny that it, it were the organization's efforts at the beginning of statehood, as well as uh, the radical bill of Rachel Cohen that ignited the process of enacting a law that granted women equal rights, at least on paper, uh, in the marital property. So let me finish uh, my first uh, presentation with a short biblical story uh, from the book of Numbers. This is, the this is it. After 40 years in the desert, when the Israelites were on the verge of entering the promised land, five sisters approached Moses and demanded to inherit their late father's rights to a land in Israel. Their father, Tzilofechad, had not born any sons. And so his family was supposed, according to the uh, biblical inheritance law, his family was supposed to lose its rights uh, to an estate in the promised land. Moses consulted with God, and consequently, the biblical inheritance law was changed, was amended. Women now were able to inherit their fathers if they had no brothers, and if they pledged to marry men within their tribes. As in the case of the 1973 uh, marital property law, this amendment was far from being perfect or even egalitarian. However, in light of this biblical story, modern Israeli uh, women's movement and organizations can be considered as a link in a, in a long line of Jewish feminist activism that recognizes transitional moments and uses family law in order to promote major social changes. Although the accomplishments are usually not as radical as the initial goals, they nonetheless can be considered admirable feminist successes. Thank you.